So what we're gonna what we're gonna have a look at today is probably one of the most difficult concepts early doors in electrical theory to get across. And that's what <coughs> happens with a coil of wire or an inductor. So in the the field of engineering you guys are in, where these kind of things commonly come up is transformers, the windings of a motor coils of relays, solenoids and so on, okay, then in other areas of electronics get inductors, they're using filters and, uh, and other kind of signal processing kind of areas, okay, and later on in, in uh, if you go on to level 5 with the electrical and electronic principles, we'll have to actually look at filters and actually build and test one to the specification, okay, so one, what, I just, what I've decided to do to try and help get this across is take a look at what happens experimentally um, with, a, with a coil when it's connected to a DC current and when it's connected to an AC current. Okay, so practically show what happens there and then go through the theory to try and explain why that happens. All right? So what I've got up on the board and on the first page, and I'm just going to run through what we're going to do, and we'll pause the video and do that, and we'll put the results on the board afterwards. Okay. So um, I'm going to. I've got a coil uh, up front here, and that's just. I don't know how many hundreds of turns there is on there, but there's there's a significant number of turns of wires. So we're talking about a coil, like a motor winding or an inductor multiple turns of copper wire. Okay, so it's going to have some resistance as well as be have some inductance about it. Okay, so we're going to measure the resistance of that coil. Then we're going to, I'm going to demonstrate to you that we can, actually, we can actually find out what the resistance of that coil is by applying a, a, a DC voltage, measuring the current, and then using that to find out what the resistance is using Ohm's law. Okay, so we're going to do that. What we're also going to do is have a look at what happens when we apply the same voltage AC at 50 Hertz. Again, measure the current, use Ohm's law to find what its AC resistance is. And I'm going to use that term at the moment until a bit later. Okay, so and you're, you're probably aware that there's going to be some kind of difference. Okay, so I'm going to try and explain that difference. So, I'm going to pause the video now and um, show you the practical readings. So, just to summarise the results, we measured the um, coil resistance and got 43 ohms. We measured, um, measured the Applied six and a half volts um, DC, calculated an expected current of 150 milliamps. And when we actually turned the circuit on, we got 150 milliamps. But when we applied a similar AC voltage, 6.7 volts, we were expecting from Ohm's law the same <coughs> 150 milliamps, but actually got 120. So the remainder of this session this morning is about explaining why that happens. So, it's about electromagnetic induction. Two scientific laws governing electromagnetic induction. Faraday's law, which states that a voltage is induced in a circuit whenever relative motion exists between a conductor and a magnetic field and that the magnitude of this voltage is proportional to the rate of change of flux. Secondly, Lenz's law, and this one is the one that means we get the extra resistance to current, opposition to current flow in the AC coil, I'm going to explain, is that the direction of the induced EMF from Faraday's law, up here, the direction of it is such that it will always oppose work against the change that is causing it to be induced. So the voltage set up 
is actually trying to stop the change that's causing it to happen. It's like a resistance to it. Okay? <coughs> if that wasn't the case, then this AC current would not do any work in that coil. So it has to be that way. Okay? So, in their words, they're a little bit difficult to understand. But I'm going to go about a way of trying to explain that to you. Because like electricity, like electric the flow of electrons, we can't see a magnetic field. So, well, certainly I don't have the kit, I don't know of a way that I can actually show you what a magnetic field looks like, other than the iron filings around a, a bar magnet that you probably saw at school. Okay. However, if we pass a DC current through a coiled up conductor, produces a magnetic flux, and the flux kind of joins together to create an overall magnetic flux that looks a bit like the flux for a bar magnet. They can form complete loops around like so, as shown on the diagram there, and they have direction, so they'll form a north-south pole, an electromagnet, a magnet we can turn on and off, because if we turn the current off, the field disappears. If we reverse the current, we'd put the north up this end and the south that end. So we've got a magnet that we can control where the poles go and how strong it is. Strength of that field can be increased by three ways. Increasing the number of turns we put on the coil. Secondly, increasing the amount of current we flow but that we pass up to a point that is, there is a limit of how much field we can squeeze in to um, the core that is down the middle, in this case an air core. And the last thing we can do to make the magnet stronger, the electromagnet stronger, is put an iron or a ferrous core in up the middle of this coil because the, the ferrous or iron based core will help the magnetic field rather be in there, it supports the field much better than air. Okay? So if we improve the core, then we'll improve the strength of that field. Any, got, anybody got any questions so far? That's when we connect it to DC. Now, if you think about what we were talking about capacitors last week, there would be, in an inductor, or a coil, a short transient period right at the beginning on DC, when that current and applied voltage rose from 0 to 7 volts or whatever we were applying. But that transient period for an inductor is very short. And for this level at the moment, we're kind of ignoring that transient period. But that would be a similar... We'd have similar formulae to those that we use for capacitors with the exponential rises and falls of the energy within an inductor. But the time constants are nowhere near as long. Okay? So, furthermore, this is electromagnetic induction by moving a magnet. Faraday discovered that if he took a magnet and moved it in and out of a coil of wire, it induced an electromotive force or EMF for short, which is a voltage, we'd measure it as a voltage across the coil, and therefore in a closed circuit, a current would flow. The EMF will also be produced if you hold the magnet stationary and you move the coil. Okay? So it doesn't matter which bit, it's the relative movement of the field around that coil. It's about those lines of magnetic force cutting across those conductors. The induced voltage will only be there <coughs> when there's movement. So you push the at, while you're moving the magnet in, you'll see a voltage. As soon as you stop, that that induced voltage will disappear. Okay, you'll get one direction of current when you move the north pole in, say arrow over to this direct uh, the direction it is. When you take the magnet out again, the induced EMF will give a current in the opposite <coughs> direction. If we was to switch the 
far round so the south pole was the one going in first. The meter would go this way first and then that way. So the direction is controlled by the poles. Okay, and the magnitude of the EMF produced, again, depends on the number of turns on the coil. If we increase the field strength of the magnet, we get more EMF induced. And if we move the, the if we make the relative movement between the two faster, we'll get more EMF. Okay? In fact, that comes from the induced EMF E is equal to V L V volts. That is field strength. Length of conductor in field that would give us that's the kind of the formula for induced EMF in a generator, but you can see where it kind of comes from. The field strength, how much conductor we've got, so if we increase the number of turns, we're naturally going to have more conductor, and the velocity of movement, how fast the flux is, the magnet is moving, or the flux is changing. This bit can be due to varying. Flux. So like I said, right at the switch on point on DC, we've got a varying flux. We had no flux, and we got lots of flux really quickly. So we get a big induced EMF for a short period. Okay? Yeah. So what we want to focus on really now, what I'm going to focus on is this bit can be down to can be down to the flux variant and that's what is happening when we connect the coil to an AC voltage alternating current means an alternating voltage produces an alternating current most commonly, what we've been applying there is an AC sine wave. Our mains does not stay at 230 volts. It goes naught up to a peak, through naught again to a negative peak, and back to that. And it does that at 50 hertz, 50 times per second. So, because the current is in one half cycle, I'll change this slightly and make it a red half cycle and a blue half cycle. In the red half cycle, current is going that way. In the blue half cycle, current is going that way. So what happens... As the supply voltage increases and decreases, an EMF, because the, what's happening here is, when we're at zero, we've got no flux in the coil. As it builds up, we've got a change in flux, so we get an induced EMF in the coil. Then when it hits the top, it's not changing at all. We're coming on to that at the moment. No induced EMF. Down through zero, it's moving, it's changing at its fastest rate. So we get a big EMF induced, and so on. So we get self-inductance in the <coughs> coil. Because it's connected to a change in voltage, it's inducing its own EMF. By Lenz's law, the induced EMF will induce a current that opposes the change that is causing the induction. So... 
What's causing the induction is the fact that the current in the circuit is changing. It is either rising up there, or falling there, or rising up there. So this <coughs> induced EMF, if the current is flowing in the red direction, the induced EMF will be trying to send the current back in the other direction. It will be opposing it, restricting it, holding it back. Light resistance. It's an opposition to current flow. This means that if you applied a current as in the direction shown, the induced current will be opposite to it. So I've just explained that. Okay. Now, any questions so far on that? And this thing, this EMF that is induced is quite often called commonly called the back EMF. You know when you start a motor, those of you, how, how many of you work in an area where you, you, you've got lots of motors? I guess you, you do, Robbie. Yeah? When you start a motor, you'll be familiar that you get a high current. Yeah? And then that falls back. Part of that is down to once it gets spinning, it's creating its own back EMF that restricts the current. Okay, so initially, you've got a very low resistance coil that you're putting four, 400 volts onto, the ammeter goes wham over, and then the motor starts to spin, and creates its own back EMF, and restricts that current back. So that's part of the reason for that. Okay. So, moving on then. What this kind of does within a circuit. We're going to consider, initially, a coil that has inductance only, doesn't have any resistance. That component in this world does not exist. We can't have inductance without having some resistance because an inductor is made out of a coil of wire that's got resistance. But for the time being, what would happen if we did have a per inductor with no resistance? When the applied voltage is at a positive or negative peak, here and here, yeah, so that's the applied voltage, the rate of change, the slope of that tangent there, you might remember slopes of tangents from maths when you're doing um, in, uh, differentiation, okay? would be zero. There's no slope to those lines. So at that point, there's no induced EMF. And what we get is no current. Okay? When we're coming down through here, so our there, and there, our slope is as high as that's going to be. We get the biggest induced EMF. Okay? Maximum current. So, what this is effectively doing is creating a resistance, or a, a, a better word is opposition to current flow, that causes... Voltage, if I draw a, 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 what's called a phasor diagram of the voltage and current, we've got voltage here along a left to right axis at zero degrees, and it creates a current that is lagging 90 degrees behind. When we talk about phasor diagrams, and we're going to go on to do a lot more work with these, we talk about angles going round in an anti-clockwise direction. Okay, so upwards is plus 90 degrees, downwards is minus 90 degrees. And if you look at this diagram here and consider that as not only angle along that line, but time, okay, 
the current peaks 90 degrees after the voltage peaks. So we say the current is lagging the voltage by 90 degrees in that case. So it creates a voltage and current that are 90 degrees out of phase with each other. If we could have a pure inductor. Okay, so lags. In actual fact, just briefly, when we look at capacitors in an AC circuit, you'll find that a capacitor creates a current that bleeds the voltage by 90 degrees, if it's just per capacitance. Okay, so are you all understanding that as best you can? Yeah, this back EMF, the back EMF in a pure inductor would actually be, at its most, the same as the peak voltage applied. Okay? But that's not achievable anyway. So, moving on a little bit further. The inductive reactance of a coil. So this, there's another phenomena about this coil that causes less current to flow when we um, connect it to AC than when we connect it to DC. And that is its inductive reactance. The opposition to current flow in a pure inductance is called its inductive reactance. It's got a symbol XL. And uh, this kind of gets confusing here because we'll end up with three different quantities that are all measured in ohms. We've got resistance, now we've got inductive reactance XL, also measured in ohms. Because of the induced EMF and current, will be greater if the applied voltage changes faster. So we've already talked about faster movement or more turns, creating more induced voltage and therefore more current. The magnitude of the inductive reactance is dependent upon the frequency of the AC voltage. If we put 100 Hz on instead of 50, we'll have doubled the frequency, we'll have doubled the rate at which the flux is changing, and therefore we're going to naturally increase the inductive reactance. We're going to increase the opposition. The back EMF is going to get bigger as well. So, we have a formula for calculating inductive reactance XL. It is 2 pi times the frequency in hertz. And L is the inductance of the coil in henrys. Okay. So, this means that as if we increase frequency, this one, if we, if we increase frequency... XL will go up, and if we decrease frequency, XL will go down. So it's a dynamic um, opposition to current flow. It changes with frequency. And we can also use Ohm's law with XL to calculate the current in a pure inductor, or the current do to the reactance of the coil by saying the IL is V, the applied voltage, over the inductive reactance. Okay? I'm going to do too much of that yet because to do that properly we need to be considering the angle associated with XL as well, which is 90, 90 degrees. But more about that in future weeks. Okay. It involves that lovely subject you all enjoyed in maths, complex numbers. <coughs> Everyone happy with that so far? Yeah? So, having said, having explained what the case would be for a pure inductor, let's have a look at what a real inductor would, would be like. A real coil can never be a pure inductor because the wires have some DC resistance. We've already seen that. So we can represent a real coil by representing it as its inductive reactance, XL, in series 
with its DC resistance. So we're, what we're considering now is that those two components together make up an inductor of her L Henry's. Yeah? With a DC resistance of R. Okay. Now, we know, because we've... Um, we don't know because of our experiment, but <coughs> resistance is not affected by frequency. So, the actual resistance of a component does not change a frequency. But, we know that XL does. So, note for DC current, the frequency will consider to be zero, no change, it's not changing at all, no hertz, and hence XL on DC would be zero ohms, and all we'd have as the resistance R, which in our coil was what, 40 something ohms? Yeah? 43, 43 ohms. Okay? So this leads to a different term being used to describe the opposition to current, the overall opposition to current in an AC circuit. It's called the impedance of the circuit. So when we're talking about AC circuits, technically, we should always talk about impedance rather than resistance. Resistance is part of it, but that's not the whole story when we connect AC. If we've got just a resistor, then that's all we've got. But as soon as you've got an inductor in there, or a capacitor, then you've got reactants, XL or XC, and therefore you've got an overall impedance as the opposition to flux. So how does this impedance um, join together to make the overall opposition so that we get 120 milliamps on AC rather than 150 milliamps on DC? So the next slide is my attempt to explain that. The impedance of a real inductor is a vector or phasor made up of resistance and the reactance of the coil. So we've got resistance on the horizontal axis, zero degrees, does not create any kind of angle between voltage and current in a circuit, they stay in phase. And we've got our XL that is at 90 degrees to that, that creates a current at 90 degrees out of phase. We can add those two vector quantities together by taking lines across and turning this into a parallelogram. And the impedance Z is the diagonal of that parallelogram, such like that. So, if we... The, the key thing here is and I'm going to show you in a minute, if, if XL changes because we change the frequency, the length of that line is going to change. The length of the resistor line will not change. But if I change XL up or down, it's going to pull the angle different, and the length of that Z line is going to be different. It's a right angle triangle problem, and therefore, if we know R, and we know XL, we can find the impedance Z, using good old Pythagoras theorem. Yeah? You're all familiar with that. Square on a hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square on the other two sides. Okay? So that's what it looks like. And this is an attempt to show you the difference and why Z changes as we increase frequency. If we have no frequency, DC, Z is actually equal to R. So they're interchangeable terms there. Okay. But as soon as we introduce some low frequency, we create some um, inductive reactants up here, pulling the Z phaser out of phase at some kind of angle to the resistance. And therefore, the overall impedance in the circuit is, is increased. So we must get... 
lower current. Highest current. Yeah? And then if we increase the frequency still higher, it pulls the, that up. R stays the same, and therefore we've got an even longer Z line, even lower current. Thought I said lowest, really, didn't I? Lowest current. Put it down here. So this is what happens with inductor. As we increase frequency, we we end up with more inductive reactants, and therefore more overall impedance to that circuit. Impedance being made up of the vector addition of re the resistance and the inductive reactants in the case of this circuit. So, back to the problem we had in the first place. Finding the inductance, the L value, how many Henrys this coil is. Remind me of what the values were. What did we measure the resistance to be? 43 ohms. 43 ohms. What did we um, measure the uh, current to be? Current on AC. What was that? 120 milliamps. Therefore, by Ohm's law, Z, the impedance of the circuit, is equal to VAC over IAC. That is, would we put on 6.7 volts, 120 milliamps, 0.12 amps, Push the buttons, please, and give me a value for Z. Six ohms and two significant figures. Yeah? Okay. So now we know Z. 56 ohms. So we can rearrange Pythagoras' theorem to find XL. We can say XL is equal to the square root of Z squared minus R squared. Fifty-six <coughs> squared minus forty-three squared equals. Thirty-six ohms to two significant figures. Yeah. Stand on the page. Also, XL is equal to two pi F L. Yeah. So if we re if we rearrange that for L, we can find what L is. So L must be. XL over 2 pi F. That is 36 over 2 pi times 50 equals. Again, push the buttons, please.
Here we go. Zero point one one Henry's or a hundred and ten Millie Henry's to two significant figures. So by taking effectively, if we measure the DC voltage in current and find the resistance, because that will give us the resistance of the coil, because we know that on DC we don't get any reactants. We then connect an AC current and measure the voltage and current flowing, and we can Using those two values, we can find out what the inductance of a coil is in Henry's. Yeah? And you're going to be doing something in your practical for the um, assignment lab report that involves you, it's the second half of it, that involves you investigating the inductance of a coil using DC and AC current. And when we, Chris and I looked at this last week and set this up, we found that coil. Um, that he measured that inductance of that coil on an instrument that costs about fifteen hundred quid a top wood um, inductance meter, and that came out within two or three percent of that figure I've now found practically. Okay, it's about. I think he measured it at something like one hundred and fifteen. So it's not a bad way to find out if you need to know or want to know what the inductance of the coil is that you haven't got a value for. Okay. So any questions about today's session up until now? Hmm? How are we doing for time? Right. I think perhaps a little bit of an idea of what you're going to do for the practical might be appropriate. Let's just have a look at the we'll have a we'll have a look at the assignment now and then I'll have a look through the uh, actual practical and more detail in the individual yeah. session. Right, for the assignment, practical investigation into determining unknown component values using DC and AC theory. Okay, so that's what you're going to do. I'm issuing today. There's a long date for the hand in, partly because we're going to take two to three weeks at least, two, two, probably three weeks for you all to get the practical work done and your data. Okay, the, the actual measurements don't, the capacitor one take a little bit longer, the actual measurements don't take that long to take. Um, you can then, you can quite quickly get your readings and then do your processing of those at your leisure and your writing of the report. Okay, so um, the hand in date is Tuesday 3rd of May, part of that long time is because well, I'm issuing before Easter and you're handing in after Easter as well. Okay, so you've got, you got plenty of time to complete it. So what, what we got then is the um, grade and matrix. And I kind of like to focus on um, what's required to get a merit. And one of the ways I try and explain to students the difference between merit and distinction is, I'd give merit, a high merit, if somebody done everything I might have expected them to do in terms of what's been taught in the classes and the guidance given. Yeah. Distinction is kind of where I get surprised. Oh, they've put something in, they've put that little bit of theory in and linked it in well, and they've done almost more than I would have expected them to have done. That's what about higher education is about, it's making you an independent learner, working out how you can put your own stamp on your piece of work. Yeah? So that's kind of a way that I kind of think about whether I give someone a merit or a distinction. 
Um, I'm going to be marking you on how you outline the electrical theory behind the practical work. So you're going to need to just do a little bit about the theory that, we've talked, that we will have talked about in class and why your experiment's appropriate and how it fits in. Second thing I'm going to mark you on um, is carry out suitable practical experiments and record the results consistently and accurately. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the in individual sessions. Okay. Um, thirdly, carry out suitable calculations based on experimental data to determine the value of our unknown um, components that you've been given. So three capacitors and, an in and a variable inductor that I'll also show you in a bit. Okay. Thirdly, um, on you writing a professional lab report that details the experimental work carried out and presents and analyzes the findings. Okay. And then lastly, that you present a professional lab report with all tables and figures numbered and titled, that you refer to those properly in your text, and that you include reference and where appropriate for the Harvard standard. I'm not too sure that there'll be too much of that in this particular type of report, but that's always there. Okay. So there are the areas you'll be graded on. Over the um, and when you actually get the assignment, have a good look at these to work out what you need to do to get the best grade. Okay. So what are you going to do? First investigation is you'll be given three capacitors marked A, B, and C, and you'll use the electrical theory you know around the discharge of a capacitor. To, to time that discharge, find out what the, um, the time constant is, because you'll, you'll have a known resistance connected during discharge. That will be the resistance of your voltmeter. You'll charge it up to a known voltage, steady, then you'll disconnect, allow it to discharge for a period of time. Think carefully about what period of time you use, but what, what voltage you go down to, Find what the time constant is, and then you'll be able, from that, you know the value of the resistor, therefore you can find the value of the capacitor, because you know how to calculate the time constant from a capacitor value and a resistor value. It's up to you to decide whether you repeat your experiment a couple of times for consistency, okay, but we're not, we're not looking at taking ages to do the practical work because it is a very consistent thing in the discharge. If you, you just need to be careful about being systematic of the way you go about um, setting the experiment up. Okay? So you're gonna, you'll do that investigation, and then you'll write a report about it that says what the purpose of the lab report is, the electrical theory behind it, the equipment that you used, and how it was set up. Circuit diagram. A picture of equipment is not a circuit diagram, okay? Because the person trying to repeat your work, and that's what a lab report's meant to be for, might not be using the same equipment as you. So a proper terminal-to-terminal -terminal circuit diagram of how it was connected is very important. And then when you want to talk about it, you just say the circuit was set up as shown in the diagram in figure whatever number it is. Yeah, don't want a blow-by-blow blow account. I connected the red wire for this and the blue wire for that and so on. Just set up as in a circuit diagram. And the, and the key points to the method, how you, how you went about turning the circuit <coughs> off, the discharge, and so on. Okay. Outline of the methods. Clear summary of the results and practical readings. Clearly laid out calculations to determine the value components from the results. Discussion of the validity of your findings in the light of the component tolerances, which I will give you an idea what the tolerances of those components are. Okay? Remember, key purpose of lab report is that it would allow someone reading it to repeat your experimental work with success. So, very much... How you tell them how you've done it is very important. And then the second investigation, the 
depending on which, in, you'll be given a, a, a resi an inductor number to work on, because we've got two, and then you might be asked to have the coils in um, uh, a single coil, AB, or a single coil CD, or parallel coils, and so on, just to, to create some different values for different um, groups. You'll work in pairs for taking the practical reasons for the way it needs to be the capacitors anyway. Um, each inductor, and that's these ones over here, has got two coils on it, so that's why we've got combinations. But what I've also got is a variable core. It's got a core that you can move in and out. So overall, what you're going to do is an experiment like we've done today with a single coil, except you're going to, you're going to find out what the inductance of this coil is without the core in, you're going to find out what it is with the core all the way in, and then at these various points A, B, C, D, along the movement of the coil, they're every 25 millimetres. With the overall aim of trying to find out whether the inductance, L, of this coil varies linearly with the core position. So if you graph um, the inductance of this, if it's linear, what shape of graph are you going to get? Inductance against core position. 25 mil, 50 mil, so x-axis will be distance of the coil, core in, y-axis will be inductance in Henry's. If it's linear, what shape of graph are you going to get? Straight line? Straight line, yeah. Okay. So, that's what I'm asking you to investigate in the inductor one. Is does the inductance of this vary linearly with core position? So that experiment gives you a little bit more analysis and validity of the results to talk about at the end, because it's probably not going to be totally linear. could be linear for part of its movement. can't remember, and I don't want to remember, but your investigation of that to find out that <coughs> okay. So again, much much the same as the capacitor one, you're going to write a report that goes through the setup, the electrical theory behind the calculations and so on, set of results, and then your discussion of those results at the end. So that's going to be your assignment for electrical science, and all of you will get to do the practical in the sessions over the next two or three um, weeks that we're here. You know you're off for two weeks as of um, finished play today, don't you? Yeah. And uh, then while some people are working on the practical, I've got, I'm going to be having some kind of typical exam questions on the work that we've done up now for the other people to work on while that practical's